everybody. Welcome back to The Beer and the Bald. I am Paul Shirey, The Beard, joined by my compatriot, The Bald, Christopher Bumbre. Hello, Chris. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hello, everyone from Alaska and Montreal. Montreal. We're back. It's Good Friday today. Yes, it is. It is Good Friday. Are you watching any Easter movies today? No. No? Laura won't allow religious movies. In this <laughs> She won't. There'll be no religion in this house. We're just going to watch the Ten Commandments and Ben Hur. <laughs> well, I mean, that's kind of religious. I'm just going to watch. I like Ben Hur. I like the original Ben Hur. I don't like the Ten Commandments. That I find very difficult to watch now, though. I've never just seen Ten Commandments. Boring. Yeah. Ben Hur is pretty good, though, because Ben Hur's got some action, at least. But um, I did go see a religious movie, though, the other day, because uh, I had to review Father, Father Stu. I went to see Father Stu. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. How is it? It was interesting, you know, because it's it's Sony and it's faith based, but it's not their company Affirm, right? So it's because it's R rated, and there's like, and it's funny because it's kind of filthy the humor. Like I think Mel Gibson and and Mark Wahlberg set a record for f bombs in their movies, and it's because it's literally like every second word is fuck, 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 you know. And it was which I was surprised at in like a religious movie, but it's not. Like, I don't know that it's necessarily made for that faith-based audience. You know, it has religious themes, I think, but it's not, it's fairly low key until like the last part of the movie. And even then it's like, I, I think it's a movie that's made for like lapsed Catholics and, you know, and, and, and stuff like that. I mean, I get, you know, Gibson and Gibson's wife who did it and, and, uh, and, um, and Wahlberg, they're all, you know, they're all Catholics that have had kind of their yeah. issues. You know, and I think the movie is is kind of specifically for that. It's getting destroyed by the critics because they're all kind of reading stuff into it. I think that's not really there. Um, yeah. Well, it was, and, you know, it, Wahlberg it was and Gibson and religion with, you know, most critics, like, let's just face it, they're they're not of that ilk. You know what I'm saying? Well, I mean, the thing about it is, you know, not everything needs to be for everyone. And this is made exactly. for a specific audience and, you know, let them watch it, you know. And I, and I was fine. I, I was... I enjoyed it. I was, I, I, I didn't love it, but I was, but I was, I was, I was relatively engaged by it when I was watching it. I didn't want to leave. I was curious to see what was going to happen. <laughs> and I mean, I think that the, well, I think that what made it, what, what, what made the movie for me was I thought that, that Wahlberg and Gibson were both very good. And Gibson, it's his first like meaty role in a while. Where, know, yeah, so not was, some direct to video fucking shitty actioner. Yeah, it's his first movie where it was like, this is Mel mm -hmm. Gibson you know, really giving a shit that I've seen in a while. So good. I'm not like that. Although inclined. he was great in Fat Man as well. He was really good in Fat Man. Yeah, I liked Fat Man. I liked Fat Man. Um, you know, I think he's like like Cage in that even if the material is not good, he tries. You know, yeah. and and but it's just the the stuff that he's in. It's really usually bottom of the barrel. Like I think he's the last choice for a lot of these movies, you know, so. Uh, such a shame. I don't know, but yeah, like you said, like, offs. if yeah. he's like Cage, you know, maybe it's like every every fifth movie is worth a shit, you know? Yeah, in, but it doesn't even seem like, like it works. I think he just can't get the roles, really. And I think he likes to work, or I think he needs to work, because he probably has a shitload of alimony to pay. He's got two <laughs> ex-wives and a lot of God kids. God damn it, he's, doesn't he have like 20 kids or something? Like, he's got some Something like that, yeah. Kids. Um, well, you know, who knows? Maybe with Lethal Weapon 5, if that actually happens and he directs it, that could be about. I don't think it's ever going to happen, frankly. I'd like it to happen. I don't think it will, though. Yeah, it's like one of those things where it's been talked about for so long and with Donner now dead, it's uh, it's unlikely. I mean, you know, they're, guy, they're getting in their 70s. Are, we supposed to, are they still supposed to be cops? Like, I, I, The only way it could really, really work it's a stretch is, already. Is, if, if, is if it's like focusing on their offspring, you know, like their they're uh like i don't know if their kids would have to necessarily have to be cops but you know some kind of thing like that or where they're pulled out of retirement to go and and do something that's the only thing i would potentially see as working as a story but who knows who the fuck knows but yeah i mean seeing <laughs> glover and gibson running around shooting guns at like that that age i just don't know if that's that's gonna work if that's gonna fly yeah no so we'll, we'll just have to see about that. Um, so, uh, yeah, I can't really uh, say much about it, but I was on a set visit this past week um, for Wendell and Wilde, which is the new Henry Selleck um, stop motion animation movie. Um, I can't say anything other than I will only put out that if you're a fan of uh, Henry Selleck's work, then you are going to be happy. 
So I look forward to sharing more as time goes on, but uh, for now, that's about all I can say. But it was nice, uh, as Chris and I were talking about prior to starting recording here, um, it was nice to be back on, on a set visit. It's been two yeah. years. The last one I was on was Army of the Dead. Uh, and that was... Wow, really? Jesus. Yeah, that was a long time ago. And truth be told, I didn't know if I'd ever go on a set visit again. Um, mm. you know, when I left... yeah. When I left Joe Blow, I didn't work anywhere for a year. I took a year off and focused on my kid and homeschooling in the age of COVID and working on my comic, which I'm still working on. I got pages sitting right here that need to be worked on. Um, we but, all uh, kind of age, I think. <laughs> it's when I saw Frosty for the first time on my set visit. I was like, hey, so we've been <laughs> up to the last few years. <laughs> the work it's and- funny i saw you know what's funny as i was doing my tokyo vice interviews my aunt that were you know uh remote and frosty was in the room there and we chatted for a bit and caught up so yeah. it was pretty interesting it's like nothing changed nothing has changed he's the same old frosty <laughs> i spoke to him a few times just in the same thing in like waiting rooms for doing interviews because i've been more you know i've been doing interviews and stuff but uh yeah, it's 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 interesting though because our our, our stacks I saw him for the first time in ages too, so it was kind of yeah, it was uh, interesting. It, it yeah. is very interesting because it's been a while, right? I mean, I was on another one. I've been on a few, you know, because they started up kind of again in December, but um, yeah, but then they shut down again, and then we had we sent somebody on one a couple weeks ago, and then I was on. Uh, I I went to the Northman the Northman. Uh, not junk well kind of like a semi junket i guess did you guys do sit down interviews you guys did yeah. interviews right yeah yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 i did i actually got like a pretty two pretty lengthy interviews i got a 15 minutes with scars garden 15 minutes with eggers which was oh nice, nice. So that was, nice. I, I loved Good. the movie so that was fun yeah it was yeah i look forward to talking about it later in the show i want to I'm, yeah. I'm curious to hear your thoughts i already have tickets uh mm-hmm. for me and my son so we're both going. i think i'm gonna go see it again actually next friday yeah, that's much yeah, yeah, yeah. Which we're is going Thursday. We'll see something twice. Well, not this Thursday. Next, wait, no, this Thursday. This yeah. coming, yeah, this, this coming Thursday. Thursday. Yeah. Um. Yeah, that's when we're going. I got them tickets, and mm-hmm. um, I think what I'm going to do is get tickets for Friday night to go see the new Nick Cage movie because I really want to see that too. So. Oh, I'm going on Wednesday. I'm going to the to to. I, I missed the press screening for that because I was in London. Oh, you poor baby. Yeah. <laughs> I missed a bunch of press screenings, but anyway, it's fine. I love London. How is London doing? I miss London. It's been a long time. It's good. I mean, there's not many masks, not much in the way of masks there, but there wasn't good. in December either. It feels like they're pretty low key about this stuff over there. Oh, dude. It was it's- nice. It was funny. Even in December when I got there, and this was like the height of Omicron, I went to the hotel and they were kind of like, um, yeah, they were, they were kind of like, uh, oh, you don't need to, you don't need to wear the mask, love. So, <laughs> yeah. well uh, all i can say is i had to take two covid tests to get on the set in portland oh did you really yeah and we were masked up for the entire set visit which sucked but oh uh, well we 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 didn't actually funny enough we 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 were we yeah we didn't we didn't have because the rules were different in london i guess we weren't we weren't really masked well, we spent a lot of it outside, I guess, but we were even, different. When, we were, even when we were like axe throwing and stuff like that, we didn't, we didn't wear masks. It's so, du- it's inter- it was interesting to me. To the only s- time I wore a mask, honestly, was when we were sharing taxis. That was it. I mean, it was interesting to me to see my peers mask up at every instance. And I'm like, are you not vaccinated? Did you not already just take a fucking funny. PCR we, we, test? We didn't, we didn't have to do we didn't have to do that. There were there was one or two. There were two people that wore masks, but it wasn't even about have to. It was like they were trained to. It was very. There were two crazy. people that were wearing masks, but I knew why they were doing it because they both had. They were both on their way to vacations, and they didn't want to get it just before they went on vacation because they hadn't had it before. Mm. So I got I get it because they didn't want to lose out on their vacations because of the set visits, and even them they weren't wearing them that much, and I kind of understood it. I was lucky though. For me, I didn't. Everybody else had to do. Um, antigen tests every day but i didn't have to because i just recovered from it so i had like a recovery form and they said they told me i didn't have to bother with them so i didn't have to test the entire time i was there because i because i just recovered from it like about a week before i went on the visit so 
it's all such bullshit. I'm not even going to go into it. Well, I was the safest guy. I think I was the safest guy there, but you know, CinemaCon this year, you don't, you just have to present your vaccination. That's it. I would imagine we'll probably have to. The irony of that could not, could not be thicker because even everybody that's vaccinated is fucking getting it. So how that matters is just fucking. Stupid. Well, I think, you know, it's, I think that you get it, but I think that it, it's milder when you get it, when you're vaccinated. But either I mean, way, you still get it. Yeah. But like, if, if it's milder though, you don't end up in the hospital. I mean, my, my case, when I had it, it was very, the symptoms were extremely mild. But you have to wonder, do they do that because they care about you or they care about everybody else? It's just, it's not I think it's, I don't, I don't, I don't even think it's that. I think it's just the liability issue because, you know, you could say they could sue the studio and say that you got me, you know, and I think that when you go on these things, you have to assume the risk and responsibility. And, you know, as much as you and I would say that we would assume the risk and responsibility, there were a lot of people that wouldn't. And if they were to, if they were to get it, they would blame the studio, even though theoretically they were supposed to take the responsibility <laughs> themselves. And you know this for a fact. Do they, are you going to so, blame the studio for their heart disease and every other fucking thing? Exactly. They blame it for everybody. And then it's the thing about COVID is you could say it caused whatever, you know, and it's just, that's the thing, you know, it caused my depression, you know, like it could, it could be like that, you know? So I get why the studios do it. I really don't blame them. And I would, and I would, and I, from a mask. liability standpoint, I get it from any 100%. true or actual or factual or scientific research, which is just all nil because it changes every fucking day. There's no fucking way. But I totally get it from a liability standpoint where they're I like, mean, I think from what I understand, though, from the people that I was speaking to there, though, I think we're getting to the point now where people are just like, we're just going to have to live with it, really. You are just like you have to and I'm live fine. With and I'm fine getting vaccinated and I want to be vaccinated because the thing is, my father is, is you know, he's, he's, if, I, if I can reduce giving it to my father just by, by whatever number getting a, getting a vaccine, I'll do it. You know, sure. and it's the same thing. And also, you know, I want to be able to travel, you know, sure. so I'll get it. I mean, I look, I got vaccinated. I had COVID same as you. Um, and it is what it is. You know, of course, I don't I may have taken tons of vaccinations. I don't care about that. I just, you know, I, I, I find it interesting that people are still like mask Nazi weirdos like this, like people have been truly like, like, like brainwashed into it like or not even brainwashed but like it's like it's like habitual almost like a fear thing now and i'm just like dude take the fucking mask off. I, don't think, I don't think it's a fear thing but i mean i would still wear it in a mall and so and stuff like that you know i mean i and do you really like if you go to a transit. mall you wear a mask sure yeah yeah Ooh. of course all right yeah well to I each their just, own yeah. to each their own well, um, i mean i didn't i don't wear it you know i didn't wear it when i went to dinner with anybody i didn't wear it in any of the events that i was going to it depends but i was also with people that tested negative so i don't know well i look forward to the day when all the shit is fucking done and gone. i feel like it's never really gonna be gone oh yeah it's going away yeah. i mean look at like the spanish flu like that thing you know fucking decimated the population nobody's con mm. nobody was concerned about that anymore um Anyways, and that was a hundred years ago, though. Things, things I know, changed. but like that's what I'm saying. Like, the distance between that time, once you know, over time, that shit just phew, it goes. They used away. to believe the earth was flat back then, too. <laughs> I don't think they believed the earth was flat at that time. <laughs> no, probably not. It was in the early 1900s. Um, so, anyways, uh, even though I know everybody came here for our COVID discussion, we're gonna go ahead and move on to movie stuff. So, something big happened in the past week. Um, that's been brewing for a while, which is Discovery's merger with Warner Brothers, um, which I know a lot of people have kind of held on to that, the, the prospects of what that could bring, uh, really myself included, although I've just been more curious than I don't really have any big theories about it. But um, there was a report uh, on Variety that discussed kind of the, the the machinations of this deal, and it sounds like they're looking to do a DC overhaul, which is kind of a big deal because if you remember, Ann Sarnoff came out uh, right after Zack Snyder's Justice League came out. It was like they had a fucking preloaded interview to say, this is done, we're moving on kind of thing. And was talking about how they were, you know, basically their integration plan for DC and all this other stuff. Um, but it sounds like uh, they're looking to go in a different direction now, which uh, I don't I'm, think it's that they're necessarily looking to go in a different direction. I think it's just that they're they're, they're thinking about making DC its own unit and putting yes, out yes. more DC stuff. Yes, I don't think making they're going more, necessarily. 
Well, they're trying to, it seems to me, honestly, they're in a way they're taking a step back, but taking a step forward and that they're trying to make DC more like Marvel as in having DC studios, which I wouldn't be surprised if there's an announcement for that shortly where they say DC Warner Brothers is now, it's just going to be DC studios. Be it's Yeah, they need, I mean, they want to get like a strong steward and I was reading like Emma Watts, which I could see, you know. Yeah, um, but they said that that. that's not going through with Emma Watts. So I don't know. She would have been good. But it's somebody like somebody like that, though. But it's not going to be Zack Snyder, guys. OK, <laughs> but, you know, and that's the other thing, like, dude, Zack Snyder just signed. He signed a deal with Netflix, man. Like he's not he's not coming back. There's no way. Why would he? But I do I mean, think we have a good chance of getting a Superman movie, though. Now, well, and that's and that was like kind of the the silver lining in this for me. Yeah. Was, you know, they're like, hey, why are you ignoring Superman? Which is a question everybody is asking. They're like, why is Superman being ignored? You know, and why are you trying to like restart Superman as something else? Like, oh, we're going to have a black Superman or we're going to focus on this. I'm like, like, what is the actual point of doing that? You know, is it just a diversity thing that you're trying to like force feed or is this a genuine thing? I personally think it's, you know, it's a, we're just trying to diversify and change things up. Well, I mean, I don't think what they're, what they're doing now isn't necessarily Superman though. Like the whole Michael B. Jordan thing that he's doing. Well, that's Val Zod, but the JJ Abrams thing is Kal-El. And I don't think that's even happening though. And I I certainly hope not because nobody wants it. it, I think they're doing that. They're doing the, whatever it is, the, 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 the awesome. Michael B. Jordan thing is going to be something different. And I think it's going to yeah, be. Yeah. And, and that is what's interesting is MBJ did not want to touch the Abrams. MBJ. Thing. MBJ. <laughs> we're buddies. Actually, I got, I got, I, I interviewed him. We're buddies. He's, we're he's smart though. And I think he knows. He is. I think he knows and that's what I'm saying. He, he knew he was like, they're like, Hey, do you want to be Superman? He's like, mm, I don't want to be Kal-El. I don't want that. He, he's fucking knows that it's going to stir up shit. Cause he's like, no, yeah, sure. you already have Val Zod who is literally the black Superman of one of the multiverses. Boom, done. You know, it's a legitimate character on the comic page that he can adapt and nobody can say shit. But they're still neglecting Kal-El and everybody that, I, that I've that i seen is like, dude, why are we not getting Henry Cavill back in the suit? Why is it taking- I, I feel like though, if they do the merger, it's, it's bound to happen sooner or later. I mean, the merger's done at this point. So now it's. I think though that I think that if they are serious about spawning, like spinning off DC, though, I think it, I think it's probably going to happen. I I feel like within the next month, I think we're going to start hearing things trickle out about what their agenda is. But it's going to take time because they're going to have to meet with everybody. They're going to have to look at what's on the table right now, uh, which you have Aquaman, Flash, Shazam, Black Adam. Uh, you also have Batgirl. And they're going to have to look at what that overall plan is. And if they get a steward, somebody to come in and get their own Kevin Feige, that person is going to need to be, and this was what was a little concerning to me in the Variety article, was that they're looking for somebody who has more of a business sense, but that's not what Kevin Feige is. Yes, he knows the business side, but Kevin Feige is somebody that understands the roots of what these characters are. That's kind of the danger about these things though. And I think that's probably why, you know, people aren't crazy about Kathleen Kennedy's run because she is a, a business person to some extent, you know? Not a creative, and I, and I not somebody that like yeah. reads comics, you know, or that like has any idea, like, you know, Feige was saying this, I remember reading a story how they were on X-Men because he was a producer on X-Men and every, they were in the writer's room and everybody was like, man, what do we do with this? We're trying to solve a problem. And Feige's like holding the comic. He's like, guys, the answer is right here. You know, it's all here on the page. It's all the work. They probably need, they probably need like a pretty strong, I mean, I think think it shouldn't be one person. I feel like it should be two people though. I was just going to say that. One business person, like an Emma Watts or a Stacey Sure or something like that. Get a business and and get somebody that's read fucking comics and actually loves it. a fucking nerd. (laughs) You need a fucking nerd and a businessman. And dude, I'm telling you, that shit will fly. You know, you have like the, you know, between those two people, whoever they may be, uh, could figure those things out and maybe pull, you know, look at, I, I don't understand why they aren't looking at filmmakers or screenwriters for that matter, in terms of who they would put in those positions. I think they're constantly looking at executives. You mm-hmm. got to get away from the executive aspect and look at people. Feige was a producer, you know, he was a filmmaker. He wasn't just some fucking suit that walked in and took over Marvel. He cut his teeth making these films. And I think that's where, uh, where DC discovery should be looking and looking for somebody to take over is they need somebody yeah. that has that experience and experience on comic book films and that understand really what people want to see 
you know, it's really not that difficult. Um, but it does sound like they're looking to, as you said, you know, bring back Superman and also to, they, they were interested in doing more things like Joker, the Joaquin mm-hmm. Phoenix, Todd Phillips, Joker, you know, kind of these, I guess, one-off or ex, you know, potential franchises that involve characters that are kind of your fringe characters, but not unknown kind of fringe. There's a bunch of characters that have not gotten their day in the sun yet from DC. There's tons to fucking pluck from. So it'll be interesting to see, but I mean, at the same time, the track record's not bad. I mean, the Batman is a huge hit. Yep. You know, so. Batman was good. Yep. You know, Aquaman was a billion dollars. Uh, you yeah, know, Woman like 84. I think you can call that just a loss. Like it fucking sucked ass, but I it think wasn't it was a financial good. failure by any means. It was a huge suicide hit. Squad. The Suicide Squad was a pretty big flop, though. Yeah, that's despite but, what people are kind of trying then, to spin it, it was a disaster. But then you got to look at the Suicide yeah. Squad spun Peacemaker out, which is like what the most streamed show of the year. Yeah. Like, so there's there's again there's that's another silver lining right there that you can. It's it's about. it's interesting though because I think what's probably led to all this though is the fact that the pipeline has really dried up because everything's been delayed and shifted because yeah. they really don't have much coming out this year. Like I don't think they have any. They have Black Adam, which is Black Adam they, and Shazam think, now, but which is and I don't think either of those are going to be billion dollar movies. Those are both going to be like Shazam will probably do better than Black Adam, but I don't think either of those are going to be huge films. I think it's they'll be really. Okay. It's so hard to say. It really is because. I mean, they really, they need like something like The Flash or they need like Aquaman. But unfortunately, those movies, they both need time to work on them, you know? And The Flash has got a big problem too with Miller. I mean, it depends on what's going to happen with him as well. Well, I saw like that the Hawaii couple that like had filed charges dropped everything against him. So I'm like, I'm like, okay, somebody paid those motherfuckers off. Big time. (laughs) Like, they like dropped it with prejudice, I guess, which I, I guess means like they were like, we really don't want this fucking charge. Yeah. So they must have gotten like a nice payday. Like WB is out there cleaning up Miller's bullshit for sure. But like, dude, I, you just have to wonder what's going on in Miller's head, you know? And and I said before, I think it's on, on, the, on Elon Musk's Twitter that, you know, Miller, if he's got true mental issues, I, I sympathize. He needs to get help. Um, but if he could, if he's getting his shit together, there's a lot. There's so much writing on this. This is like a huge, tremendous business deal. When, he all, when it all comes down to it, we can talk about art and all that other stuff. But this is commerce, man. This is this is show business. And like, there's so much writing on the Flash in terms of story and setting well, up and it could be a big and all that. For, for Ezra Miller too, though. That's the thing, you know? Like why? If they can play their cards right, it's going to be a big movie for Miller. I think I said this on, on the last podcast, so forgive me if I'm repeating myself, but, you know, Miller's behavior reminds me of, of some of the soldiers that I served with, where you have these guys that when you're, you're in combat, when you're deployed, they are fucking on it they are great soldiers they're like the guys the most reliable most dependable guys they like they're like this is the guy i want on this patrol i always want this guy and then you get back to garrison back to the united states and they just lose their fucking minds and they're like the worst soldier because they're always getting in trouble they're getting arrested they're getting drunk they're starting fights and it's just like they're at their best when they're at war and at their worst when they're at home and I feel like Miller's kind of like that. It was like, you know, he when he's making his movies and he's staying busy, he's fine. But then as soon as you turn that guy loose, it's like, oh, shit. So well, I think Miller, really Miller probably it. just needs help. And I think that we're kind of, you know, everybody is kind of knee jerk in that way, though, where it's like punish this person, punish this person, where it's like sometimes maybe the person actually needs help. Yeah. And, well, and that's what I'm saying. Like, if he needs help, you know, get him some help, get this guy some help. But speaking of people, that need help did you see mammoth's comments this week david mammoth i, I think he has i think david mammoth has dementia though i think that's what i don't Wasn't think it I, something I, I, about I, saying that like all teachers were pedophiles or something something I, like that all male teachers were like pedophiles or something like that i think if you look at what he's been saying lately i think he has dementia i don't think that's a right wing oh, thing he's got to be in wing. 70s now right he's pretty yeah old. i think that sounds like early onset dementia or something fucked up like that because no rational person would say shit like that i didn't see that's you know it's a shame because i love man's work but yeah fuck how it's 
social media has ruined so many people for me. Oh, me too. <laughs> I'm just like, God damn it. Fuck. Like Seth Rogen. It's like, I can't even watch a Seth Rogen movie or anything anymore. I'm just like, this dude's such a douche. I'm like, that's such a shame, man. I hate it. I hate it. But speaking of hate, um, sadly, we lost Gilbert Gottfried this week, which is awful. And I guess he was uh, was suffering from something. I don't know if he had cancer. He had some some uh, some type of battle that he was fighting. Um, but he was sixty seven. And uh, it sounded like it was like a long term like heart disease, long term illness. Yeah. Um, but it's 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 sad because he was actually just recording episodes relatively recently. Yeah. So I don't think yeah, he's been he stayed busy throughout. I mean, I was looking good, over. Uh, I like I like Katrina Longworth's show. Um, you must remember this, and he just interviewed her like the other day. It mm. just went up, and uh, and it was a good interview. But he was quieter than usual in the last couple of interviews because I, I listened to that show quite a bit. He was still doing the intros though, and he was still funny, and he was still make you know cracking wise. But he did seem quieter than usual because usually he's quite into it. Like he gets really engaged by the conversations. Because yeah. the thing I didn't know about him until I started listening to this podcast is that he's a huge movie buff. Mm. and he know he knew a lot about movies yeah. and a lot about old hollywood i would interview like really interesting guys with his with his colleague frank santo padre who's like a producer on the view or something and um i was just listening to another one they did recently where gilbert sounded quiet and it was a guest that i, I think he probably would have been excited about was uh, uh john astin you know gomez mm. from family. yeah yeah like 92 92 and still really sharp and really with it right and he was like making jokes and stuff like that and he was saying he had he quit acting because he became the head of the theater department in, in like john hopkins university like 10 years ago when he was in his 80s <laughs> they hired him and he's like 92 and he was in his office on facetime um <laughs> and he's still like if you listen to him he's still like sean Aston's stepdad but he um but anyway but it was it was you know that, that i love that show though as much as i like gilbert gottfried as a comic i think for me i was a bigger fan of his podcast because i listened to it yeah it's like time. podcast like really took off huh his podcast is terrific and it's just really good for old hollywood stories and the thing is he gets away with so much though because like he could he could be totally he could make the most off-color joke cancelable joke but it's gilbert gottfried, <laughs> it's gottfried. Hey, come on. <laughs> and everybody would start laughing you know, like it was just, it was I'm wondering like, was, if you could have something here and there's something. Well, if you listen to like, what was this? Arquette, if you look at her on, on Twitter and stuff, she's like kind of like a really like, you know, extra woke, but he was making all kinds of like sex jokes. And she's like, oh, Gilbert, you're so funny. <laughs> and then she was saying like, oh, he was a wonderful man. And, and he was, he was a great guy. There was this really touching clip though that went up the other day where there was this autistic kid who basically became non-vocal. And he would only communicate to people as, as Gilbert Gottfried as Iago <laughs> in Aladdin. Oh and god, that's funny. Kind of, and that got him speaking again, though. And that and he was able to eventually start talking again, but only like with the Gilbert Gottfried voice for a while. And then eventually <laughs> it got to the point that he could speak normally and he was telling a story. And then Gilbert Gottfried comes out and he's like, oh, ow, ow. <laughs> and he was kind of like, and then the guy did the great Gilbert Gottfried. He's like, it's Gilbert Gottfried. <laughs> God, hey, what are you doing like he was apparently like a really and i have i have we have a lot of mutual friends on facebook because i'm friends with a lot of the old timey hollywood folks you know because i like that whole that whole gang and everybody there was not a not an unkind word about him like apparently a wonderful guy yeah yeah it seemed that way you know and he's who could who could mistake that that distinct voice you know it's kind of like, i mean his Sam oh, really? Kinison or Rodney Dangerfield, like all these like great comics, you know, that Did have- you ever see the, Ar the Aristocrats though? The animated movie? No, no, no. You never heard of this? The Aristocrats? No. What is that? Oh my God. Okay. So no. So, <laughs> so 9-11 happens and uh, <laughs> Gilbert Gottfried the next night gets up on stage and makes a 9-11 joke and people start booing him oh. and he goes, you know what? This is joke I'm going to tell the Arist- He goes into this whole thing. And it's this famous old timey yeah. joke. And they made a documentary about it. Nobody had heard of it until Gilbert Goffrey did it. The rumor is Gilbert Goffrey made it up on the spot, but a lot of comics say it's this old vaudeville routine where basically the sum of it is there's a talent agent, a family comes in, a man, a wife, and his daughters. And then you elaborate from that. This is a great act. What's it called? The Aristocrats. 
anyway, so, but he starts going on about how, you know, two longshoremen come up and start like, you know, I, I can't go into it, but if you look at it on, on YouTube, it's the grossest thing ever. And they just, these, <laughs> these jokes. And it's like this, it's this, it's this comics hobby of like one upping the person and making it more disgusting, you know, and more and more insane and nothing is off. And he gives this whole thing. He goes crazy. He makes it so longshore men and, and, you know, and, pedophilia and, and 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 bestiality and all kinds of weird shit and and it's and it's this joke and people are laughing like out of control laughing because it's so it's so inappropriate <laughs> but but it's genius as well right and then you see people like crying in the audience that they're laughing so hard and he goes well oh, that's a hell of an act what's this joke called the aristocrats and it was <laughs> and it's this famous famous sketch of him you got to look it up afterwards also, yeah i have to look it up on youtube and, gilbert godfrey the aristocrat it's it's insane i have to look that but up. it was so yeah. like but yeah <laughs> that's funny I'll have to, yeah i'll have to look it up because i'm just not familiar with it at all um uh, like when i think of honestly when i think of gilbert godfrey i think of like beverly hills cop 2 and the adventures of ford fairlane in terms of movie performances i always think of those you know and it's just they're fairly small roles but I always think of him, you know, and he I was great forward. on Gilbert Gottfried. He did. He would often have people from his movies on and he got he got Barrett Oliver, the kid from Problem Child to come on. Oh, and he was and he was, he was like he's in his like 30s now. And he was like talking to him and he goes, so what are you up to? Like, what are you up to these days? And he works in like IT and they were talking about it. So what happened with you? And he was like, and he was talking about it. And it was like his dad was a real asshole. And they were talking about it. And he goes, your dad sounds like a son of a bitch. And I just want kind of, I want you but, to do a whole podcast in your Gilbert Gottfried voice. Gilbert Gottfried, yeah. But it was it was great. And he would do the podcast like in that voice, but oh, but he shit. didn't really necessarily talk like that in real life. If you watch the documentary, there's a great documentary about him called Gilbert, which is really good. Um, but he was funny. He was the cheapest guy though. He would he had a suitcase full of like soaps that he got from hotel rooms that he would bring around with him. <laughs> To like different so his wife would always make so fun of him like you're so cheap with that kind of thing but so generous to his family and friends but like really <laughs> cheap with himself like he would recycle he'd take soaps from all the hotels that he was at and put them in suitcases and save them good lord man <laughs> good lord yeah yeah he's, well, he's i mean it's really i was really sad to hear that he died and then there's that famous photo that's going around of, of him bob saget and louis anderson and they all died within six all months died, of each other and yeah. then norm mcdonald too and they were all like they were like a unit. They were all really close and they were all on his show and they were all funny. It's sad. The saddest thing about these, these older comics dying is we've lost, we're losing a generation of these guys, well, but they're young. Not only they're not that, but they're in their sixties. But who's taking over? Cause comedy Nobody. feels like it's dying, man. That's the thing just about, tragic. And the thing about Gilbert Gottfried and the thing about a lot of the older guys is that they could kind of tell it the way it is, you know, and you couldn't yeah. really cancel them because they didn't give a fuck, you know, and they were, yeah. and it was, and it was, so and they're they not could, trying to build a career and like people, but people, but people would listen to them as well. That's the thing. Like God, like Godfrey would say shit, you know, against council culture and people would actually listen to him and they'd be like, you know what? He has a point because he's so sharp and he's so funny, you know, that you can't deny that, you know, well, I mean, that's what the best comics are. You know, they're giving you a commentary. Yeah. Like look at George Carlin. You look at like so many of these people that it's like, you st I still see George Carlin quotes pop up all the time. And as I, I see George Car Carlin this. quotes from people that would cancel George Carlin, which always annoys me. <laughs> it's crazy, man. Be but like, so triggered by what George Carlin would say or Richard Pryor. Like, yeah. geez, really? You yeah. think you'd be a Richard Pryor fan if he was still alive now? Like, fuck. I mean, even Eddie Murphy for that matter, you know, like you look at his older stand up, but it's like, you know, what the fuck? Like, how far back are we going to cancel people here? Like, it's hard though. Eddie Murphy, I mean, the thing about Eddie Murphy though also is he he also apologized, but still does it. You know what you want? Eddie Murphy, the thing about Eddie Murphy is when he's blue, there's nobody funnier than him. Like he's still really funny. If you listen to his Marin interview, he's he's do, like yeah. he starts off, he's in like PG mode, but then Marin starts making fun of him and saying, like, you you look like because we were on video, he goes, You look like you're sitting in an, an outback, your own outback steakhouse. And then like, <laughs> like, he starts like laughing because he likes being made fun of. And then he gets like into blue mode. He's like, this motherfucker. And he was telling these stories and he get and he starts getting into he got and it's really funny because he gets comfortable and he's really into it. And his comedians in cars with coffee is I was just gonna mention that. That was a good, that was a really good episode. 
of that. But it is like, I, that's why I hope Murphy gets back out in the road and stuff. Cause he's one of the last guys of that generation, you know, that can still, that, that can still tell it the way it is, you know, and people will listen to him, you yeah. know? And I'm looking forward to his movie with Jonah Hill on Netflix later this year. Well, me too. And then I read, he's going to maybe do a George Clinton movie and they hired yet another director for Beverly Hills Cop 4, which yeah. is like Lethal Weapon 5. Like I'll believe yeah. it when I see it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so anyways, sure, sure, sure. speaking of action movies, I know we both saw a, a movie this past week called Ambulance. And I absolutely loved it and absolutely hated it. Um, oh, now you see me, it was just love the whole I know. I saw, I saw your comments and you can, of course, elaborate. Um, for me, I was like, it was, it, it really was, it was truly a roller coaster watching that movie in terms of how I felt about it. Not just the movie itself, but I was just kind well, of- What like, about it didn't you like? Okay. The dialogue, the acting, which Michael Bay said is like almost entirely improvised, just is so fucking stupid. Like, it's just fucking stupid. It's just not- I thought the, di- I thought the dialogue and the acting was great, to be honest. Like, I thought the- I liked, I, I thought Isa Gonzalez was the whole show. I thought her performance- Really? I thought the Hall was amazing. I loved Yaha Abdul-Mateen. I loved, I loved Garrett Dillahunt. I thought it was great. I like Garrett Dillahunt. I thought Hall was just- Michael Bay as a cop. I thought Jillian Hall yeah. <laughs> even true. had his dog Nitro. I thought that Jillian Hall was just too over the top. And I think you really need that though in a movie he like wasn't that. Reeled he was in as a character, but he just was so inconsistent as a character. No, he was going like Cage almost. Like he was doing that kind yeah, of role. He's like not was, as good and, as Cage to do that. I loved it. I loved the excess of it. I loved like the slow motion. I, I loved the when they're listening to Christopher Cross. You know, I loved all, all that shit. I thought it was great. That's the kind of movie that I love. It was like a movie from the year 2000, which is what I really liked about it. It but, definitely you know, had if those it had been qualities. Made, if it had been made in 2000, though, it would have been different. It would have been probably more of a conventional movie because what would have happened was the paramedic would have been the lead and it would have been a guy, probably would have been somebody like Nicolas Cage. The two, the two hijackers would have been evil. And then probably the female role would have been the cop that's chasing after them. Yeah. whose partner was shot and the that paramedic and the right. cop would have hooked that up. That sounds about right. And the paramedic and the cop would have hooked up. And at the end, the paramedic cop would have taken both those guys out and it would have been a cap. <laughs> like it, that's what the movie would have been back then. It probably wouldn't have been Michael Bay. It probably would have been like Dominic Senna or something like that, which still would have been good. Yeah. But I loved Ambulance. Like I had, a, I had a great time watching it. I thought that the acting was great. It was, I mean, it's, it's, it's very over the top and it's very scenery chewing, but I just loved the excess of it. I, 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 had a, a good time. It was just so unabashedly Michael Bay and mayhem. And, you know, it was just, you know, it is, even the it dumbest is. parts were great. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. A lot of it, you know, like the fact that he decide they decide to, you know, the decisions that Yahab Abdul Mateen's character is making the whole movie. It's like, he's going to, like the most self-destructive decisions ever, you know? And like, there's no way anybody's going to get away with it. And the ending is kind of laughable. You know, it's, he's, yeah, it's, he's going to jail for like 20 years probably. You know, yeah. he's not going to be there for his family, but it's, but it's just like, but I love when gotta, they get involved. got a stack of money. <laughs> they hook up with the Mexican mafia and there's that big shootout, you know, and it's like, go right. Just, I think like, the I love biggest, it. the problem is, and I can, you know, I of course enjoyed, you know, the, the Bayhem stuff to a point. I thought some of it was like dizzying. Like I was I, getting I, like, that's the point of it though. I was, was getting like the movie Cloverfield to, style stick where I was like, I had to look away a few times. I was like, holy Christ. The like, movie I saw theater I went to, to see Father Stew and warning posters up about ambulance. Yeah. There was times where I like had to look away and I was like, dude, I'm a seasoned movie goer and I have to look away from the screen for a oh, second. I was, I was, was just, just like, I was, so my fucking... eyeballs were sucked to the screen the whole Ugh. time. I was, I I, and I think that was the problem I had. It just, it, it lacked a, it lacked coherence in that way, not just in the story, but I think even in some of the editing and the action, it was just like too, it, it was all over the place. What do you watch very, a Michael Bay movie for though? I mean, what Michael Bay movie can you say was honestly coherent except for the wrong? The Rock, absolutely. The Rock was like, I think that is- That was also perfect... 25 years ago though, you know? But I mean... Again, it's like the perfect blend of like, it had all the Bayhem chaos, but it also had a coherent story for the most part, you know? And it just wasn't like as like silly in a negative way. I and... think it was probably, I think Ambulance is probably his best movie since The Rock, to be honest. No or maybe way. Bad Boys too. No way. I think like 13 Hours, far better. I, mean, I, I, think I, see, I didn't think 13 Hours was that great. 
I think 13 hours is, is his best one of, I think it's one of his most genuine films anyways. Um, but, uh, I think ambulance is totally entertaining. And I think it's, uh, I think it's too bad that, you know, people didn't go out and see it and aren't going out yeah. to see it because I think that it is disturbing. I was talking to Travis Hobson about this. It is disturbing because it feels like that whole genre as a theatrical experience is getting killed off now. And it's like there were there's a couple movies that are coming out this year that if they're not if they don't perform theatrically, I think it's really going to spell doom for the genre. Unfortunately, one of them was Ambulance, and I think the other ones are probably Top Gun Maverick and um, and uh, Bullet Train. I feel like if those movies don't do well, if those other two movies don't do well, I think we're going to have a real absence of like classic testosterone action films on the big screen i think they'll still make them they're going to make them specifically for streaming now which is too bad i read, read something kind of depressing where they were like people aren't going to see ambulance because it looks like something they'd see on their netflix queue and it's like it's not though it's you need that experience you know the movies that you and i loved when we were growing up like speed and even die hard those would be streaming movies now isn't that crazy it's fucking insane, dude. Yeah. But that's, you know, that's that's the the genre shift. I mean, it my my dad's heyday, it was westerns, right? Westerns yeah. were the the biggest genre. Now westerns are just sporadically made. They're still made. They they there's tons of them. There's great, you know, modern day uh or, or not modern day, but you know, modern westerns that have been made um that are great like unforgiven you know winning academy awards but that was nice like, we can't even call that modern anymore though because that was 30 years ago yeah like it's yeah, just that true. that's the thing like you what's the you know i try to think of the last good modern westerns and it's like they're oh, all from on. yeah that was but nobody saw it like that was a very minor film you know and, and and i do love that movie but it was just like it was made at a like like i think it was like a half a million dollars to make it this thing was such a low budget movie what was the last mainstream western movie that you really liked i mean the ones that i really liked probably the proposition the and, and assassination of jesse james but those were also like indies man it's been such a long time since there's been a really really good one because you know i always think of like you know i like true grit i thought the old. true grit remake was pretty good but i watched it once i don't ever need to watch it again and that was also like t- over 10 years ago yeah. You know, it's a long time. I think the real, the only real Westerns we're getting these days are on the small screen, you know, like Yellowstone 1883 was a real Western. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I think that, you know, open range, even that though was like 15 years ago, you know, so. And that was really good. Well, and Costner's filming a uh, Western this summer in Utah. Yeah. So right. Uh, starring and directing in it. So I'm sure it'll be good. I, I the only think the only thing about Costner is I, I wish John Barry was still alive. Yeah. Right. Fuck. I was reading an interview with him and he was like, it was like something I was on like on a DVD or something for Bats of the Wolves. And they're like, do you think that John Barry's score contributed to the movie's success? And he's like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, like, he says it wouldn't even be like. Wouldn't be the same movie. That, he said it's like at least 50% or something like that of the movie's success. Like he just, it was, it wouldn't even be close, you know, like. Yeah. It's such an amazing. Yeah. An amazing, amazing score. Yeah. Anyways, ambulance. Uh, yeah, it's it, I, it, it was a mixed bag for me, um, but I, I think more than anything, I just felt the disappointment of um, of people not going, and just concerns me for the future of the action genre. But I feel too that because ambulance wasn't as as cohesive with characters, and it didn't have any really big like iconic shots like Bay has done before, like Bad Boys and The Rock and stuff like that. I think that that kind of took it down a notch too you didn't really have a big heroic moment i think you'll probably like top gun maverick quite a bit because i i, I haven't seen it i'm seeing it at CinemaCon, but i saw the first act of it and, right uh, yeah, yeah. and it is it is much more like the tony scott movie than you would yeah. think like it's more it's more character driven yeah. but it also has the big action so i think that that would be for a lot of people like th- that's the one I'm very curious to see how it does because that is like a movie from the 1980s right where well, it's got the big action but it's also very character driven and apparently they screened it for Ridley for Ridley Scott uh and showed him the movie yeah. and he was very receptive to it it was very well, it's, it's done in like the Tony Scott way Tony like it's Scott even got the opening credits are the same as like the 90 the, the 86 credits you know and shit and and I mean I I really hope that movie that the rest of the movie is as good as the first thirteen minutes. Um, you think they'll dedicate it to Tony? I wonder if they would dedicate. It is. It, it is. I I know it is. I saw it. I saw that part of it. Like it's right at the top of the movie. Oh, good. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. D- Tony Scott and Don Simpson's dedicated to both of them. Oh, that's great. 
that's yeah, cool. Yeah. It's it's, it's uh, really cool. yeah, it's it's uh, yeah. Anyway, I'm I'm excited to see that. I'm excited to see Bullet Train as well. I think that could be. A yeah, really yeah. Good I'm movie. looking forward to Bullet Train. So you saw The Northman. I'm curious your thoughts. I know that you loved it. I, you know, The Northman for me is honestly one of the best movies I've seen in the last while. Like, I think those are the kinds of movies that I love. You know, if I think of my favorite movies, the movies that kind of stir me up, you know, these epics. And I think The Northman is kind of the perfect mixture of like art house and blockbuster for me. You mm. know, I was, I was talking, again, I was talking about it with Travis where we were talking about a lot of these indie auteurs that do weird stuff when they go, when they get a bigger canvas, right? And the ones that I was thinking of that have gone really wrong for me were people like Richard Kelly and David Mitchell, David, whatever oh, it is, the guy. Under the Silver Lake guy, right? Yeah, so oh. like their movies, when they got more money, they made these movies that were completely unwatchable and like ego trips, right? Yeah. Whereas Robert Eggers got more money and he made a movie that was very entertaining, that has enough of his own style that it feels like one of his movies specifically the use of like single takes like he shoots his stuff very specifically right but he also throws in a lot of entertainment value and and action and excitement and it moves fast because he wants the audience to have a good time watching it as well yeah. and you yeah. do when you watch the northman because it's action-packed but it's also got some art to it they get into like the viking mythology a lot they get into the practices the religions this la the language you know, and, but but it's also shot, you know, in scope and there's a ton of action. There's really good music and there's some heroic scenes, but then also, you know, some scenes that make you think, you know, they don't shy away from the fact that it was a brutal lifestyle and there were brutal people. Yeah. Um, and everybody's complicated in the film, which I really liked. Um, and it's very similar. And, and I didn't I didn't want to mention it to him in his interview, but he actually brought it up, uh, Eggers, that he was very inspired by John Milius and by Conan the Barbarian. And it feels a lot like Conan the Barbarian. Is that what he, he said that he was <clears throat> inspired by this? I was asking about his inspiration because there's a scene in the movie that is like right out of Come and See. And I mentioned Come and See to him. And he was like, oh, he goes, well, I'm really flattered for, for somebody to say a, a movie like Come and See, like, you know, I'll never direct a movie as good as Come and See. And he goes, but, you know, I was influenced by some other movies. And I was like, like what? And he goes, well, specifically, this is John Milius, the films of John Milius and Conan the Barbarian. And it was cool. I was like, well, I felt that when I was watching the movie and I didn't want to mention it. He's like, no, no, totally. So that was 100% one of his influences. That's awesome, man. You need yeah, more yeah. John Milius influence out there. Yeah, yeah. That's but he's very thing. left ring as well, though. That was the thing, like not like Milius because he was like, one, he said he didn't want to do a Viking movie because he said that he, he kind of, it annoyed him with like how people kind of, you know, extreme right wing groups kind of, you know, identify themselves with the Vikings. But then he said he, he was prejudiced against them and then he looked into it and he said, that's actually great. And, you know, he, he's, he's an interesting guy. If you talk to him, yeah. very, un, actually very unpretentious and down to earth, but I'm a fan yeah. of his work, man. I love, I love the witch. Um, I loved uh, uh, the lighthouse and there are parts of the movie that you watch specifically. I think the beginning, the first act is going to be like, cause it's very like kind of lighthousey and, and strange, you know, but then, it like it, it that's like the first 15 minutes but then it kind of becomes a more of an adventure film in some ways you know and there's a ton of really good action like there's a really re a couple really good fight scenes there's a really good one between the mountain from game of thrones and alexander sarsgaard oh and, nice and it was sarsgaard and i was interviewing him and i was like it was like fighting that guy he goes it was terrifying and he's like, thank, <laughs> thank god thank god he's a nice guy because like <laughs> And then Eggers was saying the whole point of the movie was he was trying to cast guys that were taller than Skarsgård to fight him. That's and gotta like be guy, tough, yeah. Clay Spang, who plays the main villain, is 6'5". Jeez. Yeah, yeah he's getting like everybody... is, that's a, that's a, I mean, Jesus. Yeah, he said he had to hire like the tallest actors that he could find to make him look short. <laughs> that's but, and Skarsgård's like body is insane that like he really got into crazy shape and it's it's pretty amazing I feel like he's and just like, oh, perpetually in crazy shape so Look. when I saw him he was slimmed down a bit he was telling me that he couldn't like he can't he said he's he's lean by nature because he's yeah. tall and stuff but he said he had to put on a lot of but he said he lifted like boulders and stuff like that like the character like his labors that he would have because the guy gets enslaved it was it, yeah it was, he was talking about that kind of thing but it is kind of similar to, to Conan and um but more, you know, more intimate, I would say. Like, it's not, you know, I think part of it might be the fact that it was COVID. Like, it's not armies battling each other. It's much more of a, you know, it's based on Hamlet, you know, that was that inspired Hamlet. And it's more of a, 
a contained, you know, um, revenge story, you know, mm. so it's not, so it's more like one-on-one -on -one fights and stuff like that than, than big, like epic armies. But I think that works for the movie though. Nice. Well, yeah. and I, I loved can't it. Wait to see I it. truly loved it. I can't wait to see it. Uh, I, and that's another one that I hope does really well. I don't know that it necessarily will. I'm, I'm inspired by the fact that our review for it did really well. Um, but you know, I, it's, it's so dicey, but I think that from what I understand the studio, nobody made it to make money. I think it's, they just want it to perform well enough that, because I think they're confident that it'll do well. It'll find its audience eventually being it on streaming or whatever, but right. I really would love to see it do well in theaters because I'd like to see more movies like this. And, and Eggers, I think is like, if we're, if we're talking about directors that could eventually become like directors that we look at as really great directors, I think Eggers is probably one of the ones that's coming up now that I would say is someday I would bet that's on. The potential. Yeah, that has the potential to truly be like one of the best directors because yeah. it is a bold, singular vision when you watch the movie. He does have the thing where you watch it and you're like, oh, this is a Robert Eggers movie because the way he shoots it with, like the, with the single takes and stuff, yeah. it's very identifiable. You know, he's, it's got the look, you know, but... And I feel like there's a lot of other people that don't do it. And then the other ones that do do it, you know, like, like, um, you know, like what Richard Kelly did and what the other guy did is that they make it so inaccessible and so personal that who else would ever want, they made it for an audience of one, you know, whereas this one is made for everyone, you know, yeah. to some extent. I mean, not everyone, it's fucking violent, but it's good. But I feel like you'll love it. I'm sure your son's going to love it. Oh, I'm sure you will. He loves like Gladiator and shit like that. So, you know, um, anything with, Anything with some ultra violence. My son's, you know, he's super into anime now too. So, you know, all that shit is like part and parcel. So I'm excited for it though. And I really love Edgar's style. So, and I take your, uh, I take your recommendation seriously. Um, I think more than anything with you is that even if I don't agree with you, I understand where you're coming from. So I can form yeah. kind of like, you know what I'm saying? Like, like we've, we've known each other for a long time now. So like when we, when you give your opinion on a movie, even if like, I don't agree with it, I know exactly what you're saying. So I can kind of pick those things out. So I'm excited. I think you'll at the very, at the very least, you know, respect it, but I, I have a feeling you'll really like it though. <clears throat> and it, but it is one of those movies. It's a lot to take in on the first view. I'm like, I'm actually going back to see it a second time when it opens. Yeah. And it's very rare that I do that with a movie. And I feel like it's going to be one of those movies I'm going to like the more I watch it. But I mean, I loved it the first time. So yeah, I, I kind of have that feeling too. I, I honestly, a lot of times with these movies, it's like not only do I hope I like it, but because my son's getting much, much older, he's going to be a teenager next month. Um, is you know these are like those years where you really start to formulate, you know, your viewing habits and and what what you're into. So I always, I'm always like hopeful that he'll like. Well, hopefully, he doesn't he like loves, it too much though, and grows his hair and starts living like a Viking. He's already growing his hair long, so I can't stop that yeah. train um <laughs> but like he loved ambulance he loved the batman um and i had mixed feelings on both of those <laughs> so we'll see yeah. um so i didn't put out a call for questions on this one so we'll just uh you all have to just forgive me uh it just kind of spaced on it um but uh we'll talk briefly about anything that we're watching i was going to mention uh, i have been watching tokyo vice like crazy and writing about it like crazy oh yeah i'm, I'm i haven't started yet i'm waiting for the season to end and then i'm going to dig into it I, I, what i've heard what i've heard though it sounds like it's right up my alley like it's this kind of thing I, i'm curious i'm very curious what you'll think so it's it's very it's slow burn uh essentially it's not action heavy in fact there's not really much action until because it's not an action show. I don't, you know, that doesn't bother me though. When I hear Mike, that's the thing, Michael Mann, he's never been an action guy. I don't, I find it. Yeah, weird he just he has like is. moments of violence, you know, like he tells think, crime stories usually. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And that's what this is. It's very much, you're yeah. digging into the underbelly of the Yakuza yeah. and, you know, you're kind of watching it from the inside and from the outside. And it's actually quite well, fascinating. I'm uh, curious as to whether or not I like El Gore because I'm hit and miss on him. Yeah, I find I like. I him find I I love the show. I find him back and forth, but the thing is, it's a it's an ensemble show. Yeah, like Adelstein is is kind of the 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 singular focus, you know, as the expat working in Japan and trying to like. But there's multiple characters that are focused on him. When the ones that I'm really impressed with are, is Rachel Keller's character, who is mm -hmm. like a hostess there that that came to Japan as a as a Mormon on a mission. 
uh, and ended up staying. And, you know, she's got an interesting story that's going on like she herself. In a, on Black Rain. Yeah, yeah, kind of like that. And then you have um, the, the one of the main Yakuza players, uh, is, who is a younger guy. I think his name is Sho Kasamatsu. Uh, he is amazing. Like, I love his character. And I love, he, he plays Sato in the show and he is great. And he's like, kind of like befriends Jake and they have like kind of this thing going. But at the same time, it's almost like, they're friends, but enemies at the same time, which is yeah. cool. I like that dynamic. You know what I'm saying? Um, and it really does dig into the journalistic side of, uh, of, of, well, everything, you know, cause that's what ultimately what it's about is how, like how they report in Japan. Um, and, you know, Ken Watanabe's character is, is, is great. Ken Watanabe is great uh, in general, but um, yeah, it's a slow burn crime thriller is the best way to put it with multiple things and multiple characters and stories going on. And I've just been fucking immersed in it because I've been writing about it nonstop. Uh, and I just got episodes six through eight uh, for screen. What, you, so I'm gonna, what so else I'm have you watched? Uh, I've been watching Halo um, almost like out of duty in a way. Um, the, the thing about Halo is that I love the special effects. I think that those are really refined and nice for uh, this show, but man, the characters are just not really hitting. And I want to love Pablo Schreiber in the role, and I just don't. Mm -hmm. And I hate that I don't, you know? Uh, and I know that Halo is not really something for everybody. It's not like, and it's not meant to be, but man, I just feel like they're, they're focusing far too much. This is one of the rare times you'll hear me say it, far too much on character and not enough on action. Yeah, You know, it's Halo, like blow some shit up. And yeah. I'm watching episode four, and I haven't finished it yet. And that's just like, nothing's happening. Mm -hmm. Nothing's happened for, ep for like two episodes other than him getting injected with Cortana. Um, the other thing I'm watching is Moon Knight and I am just not, I'm not getting it. I'm not hooked in. I, I, some of it is interesting that multiple personality stuff, but at the same time, it's also annoying. Um, and it's just not there's people that are like the moon knight is the best i've ever seen it's the i feel like everybody says that every time there's a new mcu show it's the new best show just I, like you know it's funny the only mcu shows that i've watched really all the way through was one division and loki so the two best ones it seems like it's not really doing much for me i haven't started moonlight yet i'm curious to watch it it's funny what i've been watching is we've been watching yellow yellow jackets which i, I really oh, yeah like. you're telling you're talking just about that last one episode left it's a great show um otherwise i've been watching a lot of docu stuff well i watched i watched all the old knives the other day oh okay uh, which i thought was pretty good but there's another chris pine movie out that i like more the the contractor, contractor. Which that was amazing i talked about it last week um but i've been watching a lot of docu stuff uh I, i've been watching this this french language netflix show called um uh, johnny holiday by holiday basically about johnny holiday who is hmm. this really famous french singer like soup, like the French Elvis almost. Oh, and he's kind of a fascinating figure because he was kind of popular in Quebec because Quebec is French and and kind, but kind of obscure and he, but but then completely obscure in North America. But then this massive, massive guy in 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 uh, in France. And I was curious because he did a movie with Johnny Toe years ago called Vengeance that I thought was pretty good, and he was the lead in it. Um, and he was because he also did a bit of acting and I was just kind of fascinated by a story I watched I just put one episode on kind of at random one day and and I and I kind of got hooked into it I was I was kind of watching it to just work on my French a little bit because I don't really watch much French stuff these days so I wanted to keep keep going a bit um, but it was it was kind of fascinating so I've been watching that and then uh, I also watched a really upsetting documentary series about Jimmy Savile I don't know if you know that whole story so basically, Jimmy Savile was one of the most was one of the most famous men in England for about thirty years. He was a he he was he was the host of Top of the Pops, right? And he was just this massive cultural figure that you know did a lot for charity, children. You know, was always surrounded by children and stuff like that. And it turned well, out that I think I've heard of this guy. It turned out that over the course of his career, he he molested and sexually assaulted somewhere in the neighborhood of three hundred and fifty some odd people that they know of. And he's one of the worst serial, like serial rapists, yes. serial child molesters in the history of England. And he was, and everything was covered up by like the BBC and by show business for years. And this guy's got ties to the royal family and everything. And it's this insane scandal. It used to be a perpetual thing with the royal family. Yeah, it really does. And if you want to watch, and he, but he was worse than any of them. He was worse than Jeffrey Epstein. He was worse than, like he was, 
the devil. And it was, it was yeah, so bad. I remember I in, hearing I in, the story. I was in England. The name. I was in England once and I was talking to a, a cab driver and he said that if he had ever seen Jimmy Savile, he said that he wished he could go back in time and slit his throat. Like he was that, he was that evil. He would, he had the keys to like hospitals and he would go in and like, if there was a paralyzed child, he would go in and he would like molest the paralyzed child overnight with the keys to like the hospital that he had. He was like a psycho, right? And it was like, like, like evil. And he would do that. He would, he had this regular thing that he did. There was a girl's home for like troubled girls. And he would just go there and take them out and rape them and then return them. And they couldn't say anything, right? Like he was evil, evil, evil incarnate. Wow. And it led to this whole thing because it had been covered up for years by the BBC and a lot of other famous people from that era that were friends of his ended up going to jail, like Gary Glitter, because it was, there was a, basically like, you know, the whole, the whole conspiracy theory thing that they have about Hollywood that QAnon has about oh, Hollywood. Oh yeah. yeah. It was like really happening in England at the time. <laughs> they were the drinking 70s. baby blood? <laughs> no, not that. No, no. But there but was the like pedophilia stuff. Yeah, it yeah. was like almost like an underground network of pedophiles. Yeah, but that's bit. you know, that's been and it might have gone that's to the, the thing royal that's family. been in Hollywood for forever too. It's and like it might have gone thing. to the royal family. And it was and it was and he was buried, he was a knight, you know, and he was knighted and he was and he was when and he was buried with full honors and they turned his grave into landfill. But it, but if you want to be really upset by something and see like how much people don't give a fuck about the mentally handicapped, about children, about you know lower classes in England, about women, you not women, girls. He never did anything to women, only girls, only children. It was his thing. He never he never assaulted women. It was only children because he was he was such a you want to see like how how deep evil can go sometimes and, and how it could be unchecked watch that documentary on netflix it is it is so unbelievably upsetting but they almost don't go hard enough though on the royal family because i could feel them pulling back a bit because they're british right i could feel them pulling back a little bit but there's um and and steve coogan's doing a like a series about it where he's playing jimmy savile and apparently that's very controversial because they're like Jeez. he's going he's going deep into it because it it really is one of those things like generations of people that were covering up for him at the bbc and they interview his producer and they're like, how did you not know? And the guy's like this old British guy who's like, I, I just, I, I didn't know. I wouldn't have all that. I'd say that would be rather, rather <laughs> preposterous. And it's just, you know, these <laughs> British, old plummy British guys that are being confronted that have like, that are not used to any kind of pushback in their lives. Yeah. And it's, 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 you should watch it just to be, but you'll be like horrified. I mean, maybe I'll do a double feature with that cannibal Holocaust, you know, Schindler's List. We'll just have a, we'll have a fun night. I mean, the thing about Jimmy Savile too, which is brilliant about the way they did it because it's two parts is that the first half like is almost like a biography that like celebrates his career shows like, you know, the, what he was doing and how funny he was and the good that he was doing and the charity. And it's almost like an episode of biography. And then it's like, oh, and also he raped like 350 like, some odd children but wait. at the end. And then it's like, and it's like, he's also the worst monster in like British history. And it's subtitled Jimmy Savile, a British horror story. Cause that's what it is. Yeah. I remember hearing, I just, I wasn't familiar with his name, but I remember hearing about yeah, that. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a Netflix documentary. And it's, it's fascinating. It really is. Well, I don't think we could leave our listeners on a higher note to be no. honest. Like, I mean, that's the way to wrap up the show right there. Everybody get ready. Go watch Jimmy Savile. And, well, and I saw the life. John Wayne Gacy doc just dropped too. Netflix really likes their trauma shit. Eh? <laughs> I mean, it's got to be doing well because they're fucking pumping that shit out like crazy. So, and I get oh, this, it. This Some of the news just came out though. Um, so you watch, uh, you watch Yellowstone 1883, right? I have not watched it yet. Oh, well, the main girl in it, Isabel May, her and KJ Apa just got cast in the Wonder Twins movie for HBO oh, Max. Yeah. I did see that. I saw yeah. that. It popped up just before we started. She's or really good on this show. While we were listening. So, yeah. Good times. Everybody's been waiting for that Wonder Twins movie. I mean, it'll probably do well. We'll see. I mean, it's going to HBO Max, so. Unless Discovery kills it. Yeah, who knows? I feel like that woman, that girl could possibly go to the big screen now. Yeah, I mean, I think everybody was saying, like, why is it not? It really seems odd. And they, they said that Blue Beetle is going to go to the big screen, too. So, yeah, I could see them know, doing that. That changed the theatrical as well. So, 
you know, there's still money to be made in theatrical. And, you know, I think the Batman is, is living proof of that, you know, and if you want to turn it around for HBO max in a month, cool, but look at that. I mean, Batman's made 700 something million worldwide, you know, why not get that money and then get, you know, your subscriber money and everything uh, on streaming. So it makes sense to, I think it's a sensible model really. Yeah. Um, I find six weeks is a little short, but you know, if it works, it works. It's the way of the, it's the way of the future. The way it is. So anyways, that is it for us this week. We thank you guys for joining us. Uh, sorry we didn't get to questions this week. Um, I just forgot to put the call out so you can just blame me and hate me for it. Um, I do. But as you should, as you should. But uh, we'll see you guys next week and appreciate you guys tuning in and watching. Let us know what you guys thought of the episode. Or if you do have any questions or comments, we will be checking in there. So make sure that you do that. The episode will also go up on Apple and iTunes and all the other spots. Uh, shortly after it debuts on YouTube. So again, thanks for joining us. We'll see you guys next time. Remember to love what you love and we'll see you.